All right, uh, we will get started now. So I want to welcome you all to the virtual Pasadena Senior Center and our Cultural Thursdays program, a grab bag of arts and culture topics. I'm Annie Lasky, the Director of Events. The Pasadena Senior Center, for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, is a donor supported nonprofit organization that offers social services, physical fitness, and arts and culture programming to older adults. A big thanks to our members and donors who have kept us able to operate during this difficult past year when so many of our traditional funding sources were not available and so many of our programs, uh, we had to uh, figure out new ways to uh, uh, be able to offer. Spring activities do remain online. We have not yet completely solidified plans for reopening the center to regular public programming. We hope to phase programs back to in-person uh, over the summer. If you are not already on our mailing list, I encourage you to sign up for our weekly emails, which is the best way to keep up with our programs and services. PasadenaSeniorCenter.org. Uh, we do expect to keep at least some programming online because uh, although it's great to be in person, there are some things that are good about online programming, uh, such as all being able to gather together uh, from different places. I want to mention a couple of our upcoming events. So we have two more Cultural Thursdays coming up in May. May 20th, uh, Dr. Phil Pride, who gave a wonderful presentation about local birds for us a few months ago. We'll be back to talk about the unique environment of Antarctica. He's a big fan having been a couple of times and he's got great pictures and he's a really fun speaker. I encourage you to join us for that. On May 27th, uh, which is the Thursday before Memorial Day, our favorite musical duo of Bob and Don will be back to reprise their program, The Songs That Won the War. We hope to be back in person in late June with informal Thursday afternoon music events on the patio. Stay tuned for further information as uh, we get all that confirmed. For those of you who are interested in reading and writing, I wanted to mention that the new master series that starts this coming Tuesday focuses on short stories. Through four two-hour talks, Beverly Olivon will discuss short stories, their forms, and their authors. The stories themselves will be read aloud by actors as part of the presentation, so you don't even need to read it ahead of time. You can read it again afterwards. Uh, Beverly's a wonderful presenter and has been with us uh, for many years. So I encourage you to check that out. The cost is $50 for members for the entire series, $60 for non-members. And again, sign up at PasadenaSeniorCenter.org. So a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, in a moment, I'm gonna mute everybody's microphones and you will stay muted for the duration of the formal presentation. And then we'll unmute for Q&A afterwards. If you have any questions uh, during the presentation or any comments, uh, we're always interested in hearing comments as well. Just put them in the chat. You just open up that chat box with a little cartoon balloon at the bottom type in your message to everyone and then press enter and that will send your message to us. So now on to the program. I am There's some people in the waiting room, I think. Oh, okay, yeah, there we go. Oh, thank you, let me enter them in there, okay. All right, so now it is my pleasure to introduce our wonderful speaker today, Nancy Pine. Since a research trip to China in 1990, Nancy Pine has had an enduring interest in contemporary China, in Chinese and American relations, and in the comparison of Chinese and US education. Her recent book, Educating Young Giants, What Kids Learn and Don't Learn in China and America, is based on her extensive experience teaching US elementary school students and teachers and more than 30 research trips to China. Nancy has directed the elementary education program at Mount St. Mary's for 10 years and founded and directed the Bridging Cultures US-China program. Prior to that, she taught in public elementary and high schools, school, and high schools for 14 years and coordinated an innovative educational research program at the Claremont Graduate University that drew national recognition. She publishes academically in education and cross-cultural research, 
and gives talks nationally and internationally and has won numerous awards, including a City of Los Angeles honor for her cross-cultural activities. I am delighted and honored that she is with us today. So let me just bring her into conversation here. Um, welcome, Nancy. Thank okay. you so much for being with us. And uh, just before I hand it all over to you, I just want to say, in case any of you just came because you like Nancy and you think it's fun to listen to her and you just somehow missed the fact that she's just published a new book, um, that's what we're gonna be talking about. And here it is, one in a billion. And I just can say, let me recommend a nice hardcover book that you know you can open clothes and dog ear and you know put bookmarks in it's a lovely thing um it's also a really good book so um mm -hmm. i've really been enjoying reading it and it's a, a lot of fun for uh uh i think you guys will enjoy it and especially after you uh hear what nancy has to say so take it away nancy go ahead share your screen and uh, okay. actually yep. one moment let me mute everybody that's going to mute you too nancy so you're going to need okay. to unmute yourself right. okay. in just a moment there we go okay we're and good now i'll see if i can succeed here there we go it's always a great feeling <laughs> when you remember what to do on the internet so it's great to be here and to uh, to be with all you folks, uh, even if virtually. And it sounds like a lot of you actually like Zoom, and uh, it certainly has provided us with a lot of um, <coughs> uh, possibilities that didn't necessarily exist before. So <clears throat> I'm going to uh, I welcome all your questions and look forward to to all of them. And I am going to move right ahead and begin. And this is on Kindle also. So there's situations <laughs> where you don't turn the pages except virtually. Um, and uh, so it's, and it's, a, it's also available on Nook. Excuse me, Barnes and Noble for not saying that. <laughs> so, okay, now let me see if I can get this moving. Yeah, all right, come on. Did it, all right. Okay, uh, I have to get rid of a few things. Okay, uh, so I'm going to begin with, uh, by talking about my China beginnings and then about writing the book, which I really wasn't planning to do. I mean, I wasn't planning to write the book. <laughs> I was planning to write an article. And then more about on way. So, oops, it's just not liking. Let's try that. Okay. All right. So my beginnings. Uh, every journey can start start with a single step or a single flight. And in late in December 1989, another mid-year graduate student and I boarded this plane for Shanghai. Uh, we we flew to Shanghai and then took the train with a Chinese uh, her friend, a friend of a friend. Uh, to Nanjing University. We were going to meet our faculty advisor, who in fact was is a US faculty advisor, but he was collaborating with the Chinese English department at Nanjing uh, University in order to try to help them upgrade their courses since they had been shut down for 10 years during the Cultural Revolution. He had actually been there during um, uh, the spring and so had been there when Tiananmen Square massacre happened and had to leave, but then he was a, the, the faculty who are trying to help their students become more familiar with the West. Uh, asked him if he would come back and bring two graduate students with him. So that's how I ended up going. I was not planning to go to China during my uh, during my graduate years, but I ended up doing it for about 25 years. So just a little bit of uh, geography, Beijing, where I'm sure you all uh, is the capital. And then if you go down and the East Coast away to Shanghai, it's another huge city 
uh, culturally quite different from Beijing. And also um, they're very culturally different and have different dialects. And then if you go west from Shanghai, what was five hour trip when I first went and is now much shorter uh, to Nanjing, that's really my home in China. And so it was um, every trip I've made, I in fact have, uh, I spend some time in Nanjing. And then going west farther to Xi'an, which was also a capital at some point during the Chinese history. It's a cultural center. It was the beginning of the Silk Road. It is where the, uh, the very large terracotta warrior army has been found. That was found during Anwei's lifetime and adulthood. And uh, then if you go, and that's where I interviewed Anwei, if you go slightly west of Xi'an uh, to underneath the X, uh, that's where his village is. And uh, it's a poor little village called Anshang. And I've spent about, I've spent a number of weeks there. So going on. Okay. Uh, this is, I'm having a little trouble changing the slides, but it's, I'm getting used to what I need to do. So forgive me for this <laughs> slowing down some. Uh, the upper left, that's Nanjing University in 1989. Uh, it was, it looks approximately the same. Uh, these days, except all those bicycles have been replaced uh, largely by motor scooters and, and my, uh, motorcycles and cars, although there are bicycles also. Two years after that first trip, when we collected preliminary data, uh, I went back by myself to collect data for my dissertation. And what Whatever I was doing in China, I was also doing in the United States uh, to learn how children learn. And uh, so I was asking them uh, to, who, to write uh, pre, what would be called pre-writing or scribble, we might call it. If you ask a two or three year old kid to write something, in fact, that child will be very purposeful, but of course what he or she writes is not what you can read. Uh, but in fact, it turns out it's very different depending on where the child grew up. So if you grow up in China, you produce very tiny little marks. And if you grow up in the United States, you make big loopy marks. And so it's just a way of, of looking at how kids pick up a lot of things from culture um, that when they're not intentionally taught. The man in this, this picture is my uh, Chinese research colleague from that particular city. And uh, he is actually, he is overseeing the situation to make sure that the, the child's teacher is actually asking the right thing. I do not speak Chinese. Uh, I, have, I have studied it off and on in little bits and pieces when I could grab a month or so, but that is no way to learn a language. And so um, I can, I can converse in small conversations, but that's about it. And, and even if I did uh, were fluent in Chinese, I would need a Chinese research person. So all of my work has been done in concert with Chinese colleagues. Uh, later, after my dissertation, I went back and visited many, many, many school uh, classrooms. And um, as and he said, and pub eventually published a book on comparing the Chinese and American systems. I became a professor of education and kept returning to China once or twice a year to do research and consulting. And I did a lot of academic writing, which I learned to do in graduate school. And that's very tight writing. It's tied to data and to theory. It's meant to communicate to other researchers and people interested in exploring that kind of thing, but it is not meant for the general public. And uh, some people in the general public obviously read academic things because they have a background in the area, but it's just not, <laughs> those are not, they are not page turners. Uh, 
but while I was there, I explored the back streets like I do in all cities, be it Boston or Memphis or Shanghai. And I began writing what I called China images for my friends and family who were beginning to say, what on earth are you doing in China? And so I began to just tell them some of the thing experiences I was having. Uh, so that, that gave me a whole nother outlet of a, kind, a different kind of writing. I also began to collect stories of a few Chinese. Uh, the first one was of Huang Wensong, who was one of my, one of my feisty, uh, she was a really feisty uh, research colleague uh, who had grown up in China while it was developing. She was born before 1949, which was the beginning of the People's Republic of China. And so her life spanned the whole, the whole uh, period of modern China. And all the ups and downs, all the accomplishments and all of the big problems and disasters. And she was also very innovative and she pushed back against corruption and incompetent people. And needless to say, she got in trouble more than once uh, for doing that. But at 70, which is when I began working with her, she actually was still very feisty and we did a really uh, very interesting research project that turned out very well. Uh, so hang on, here we go. Uh, then a friend of mine introduced me to An Wei, and An Wei is the person who I've, I've written about in One in a Billion. Uh, my friend wrote and said, I have just met someone you have got to meet uh, because you are doing the same kinds of things. I was doing, um, we were both working to try to have American and Chinese citizens get to know each other uh, just on a personal level, informally. And so uh, he, we did finally meet, it took a while because he lived in Xi'an and I actually lived in the United States. So, and I didn't, I only went to China a couple of times a year. But we did meet and we have been in touch ever since. And what we talked about for the first couple of years were how to improve and, and think of ways to have American and Chinese citizens meet each other. And the other thing was I began to get to know about rural China because I had always been fascinated with rural areas. I grew up uh, in Northern New Jersey in the woods uh, actually in a log cabin in the woods. And I was very interested in rural living in other countries. And I had wondered during the 10 years that I had been going to China, whether or not I never have a chance to have any quality time in a village. And so it turned out my opportunity came in 2004. Anwei had encouraged an American organization called Global Volunteers uh, to come to uh, launch a program in China to help uh, young people learn English better. Global Volunteers creates programs throughout the world in towns and villages uh, with American volunteers going and helping for a few weeks at a time on projects that the local people would like help with. And so they had one in Anshan village, which was Anwei's village. This is the entrance to Anshang, the entrance road after a rain. The soil is made of loess, um, which is very fine grain soil that has blown down for millennia, millennia from the, the steppes in Northern China. And from my experience, it is definitely the stickiest th stuff I've ever come across. Uh, when I walked in it, it got, <laughs> it was, and anyone else, you just got inches and inches and inches of mud. So that by the time I had taken at least a few steps, there must be a way to do this better. I would have six inches of mud on the bottom of my boots. Um, but it was, I mean, even if you were local, from a local, you were one of the villagers, they had a lot of trouble dealing with it. Uh, they had put various stuff on the this roads and lanes in the village to try to avoid having so much mud. Uh, the other picture is at the entrance of Anshang village and many, uh, many Americans look at those, this picture and say, oh, that's not a poor village. Look at those houses. 
But in fact, the houses, uh, not all of them look that good, uh, but many of them were made of brick also. And they were certainly all more substantial than they were say 20 or 30 years ago. But inside they're very, um, very rustic, I guess you would say in a way. Uh, a lot of the area is devoted to uh, bags of, of grain and seed, of farm tools, of motorcycles and uh, various other things, farm carts. And a section is, is part of, is created as a living space for eating and sleeping. Um, not very well, not developed in, in a way that you might think was an area for living. A lot of them do have courtyards though, where people go outside and relax and, and, uh, and enjoy each other when they're not working. But it's a rough life to live in the village. I was there in 2004 in October. Uh, we taught rural high school English teachers oral English. They had never heard native speakers before and were afraid to speak to their students. And so we tried to help them get braver at, uh, at actually talking because they had huge vocabularies, but they, they didn't want to use them with their students. Uh, villagers and the villagers worked day and night. We lived with the villagers and uh, I was just astonished at watching the people I was staying with. They were out there in their courtyards until midnight, most nights, uh, husking the corn and getting it ready to dry more than it had already on the stalks. Uh, and then after that was, the, they hung those. And so they were beautiful when they were hung. Uh, they were golden, golden yellow. Uh, big braids of them hung from the sides of buildings so that they could dry more. And meanwhile, though, they, after they did that, they needed to plow and get the, the soil ready for planting and then plant the winter wheat before the weather changed. So there was enormous pressure to get everything done in time to have the crops work. I returned in 2006 in the spring because I had really become fascinated by how the rural life and wanting to learn more, how the rural life is not just in, in China, but I realized in other places, it's completely controlled by the seasons. Uh, when I got there, it was just before the winter we had ripened. And so the village was more relaxed because they had to wait for it to get to the right point so they could harvest it. So at that point, Anwe agreed to talk with volunteers about growing up in Anjan. Uh, he had been in the village in 2004, but we basically never saw him, although he was helping to plan what we were doing. And so uh, he was more relaxed. Everyone in the village was more relaxed. My opportunity therefore came to uh, to actually say that I would do something related to his background because I had realized actually by the end of 2004, he was one of these people who had actually um, grown up with his whole, his whole life being part of modern China's development. And so he had been born before 1949 like the others uh, that I was collecting as, as possible uh, I had I thought about having those, putting all those stories together into a book for Americans so that they had a more nuanced view of, of China and life in China. Uh, and my opportunity came in 2006 during, while he was talking about uh, his life growing up in Anshan and what it was like during his childhood. Someone interrupted him at one point and said, someone has got to do a PhD on this, on your life, because this is history that's very valuable and getting lost. And that gave me my opportunity to say, I'm not gonna do another PhD, but I could write an article. And that was of interest to Anwe. And so he and I, before I left the village during that, that work period, uh, I ended, we decided that I would go back uh, and 
go to Xi'an during my next trip to China, which was in several months. And I did. And we arranged to meet for three days. And he talked nonstop for three days about the history of China, about his history, and how do they interwove. And by the end of these three days, I realized that this was more than an article, although I don't think I wanted to admit that it was going to be a book. And that's on way, by the way, in that picture. So a little more about the, the village. Um, there are the women on the left relaxing in the afternoon sun, which they did occasionally uh, during this period of relaxation before the crop got ripe. And they'd come out and sew and talk and uh, play with their grandchildren. Uh, the crowd up there on the upper right is a lot of villagers coming together. They're not just from Anshan village, but also from other villages um, who, and they are, um, they were gathering to hear the local opera, the county opera, uh, which came to Anshan for a few days. And it is the soul of rural China, at least this part of rural China. The opera is very much, uh, in them, is all I can say. When you hear them sing it, you realize that it's expressing the hard work and the, the terrible times that they've gone through, uh, just trying to stay alive and not be hungry. On the bottom right is the part of the center of China. I'm sorry, part of the center of Anshan. Um, and it's actually, uh, Anshan is about the center is about three times that size. The main street or the main road in Anshan is about a city block long. So it really is not a very large, uh, large village. And it really is quite poor. So I began interviewing Anwei uh, in, the, in the very end of 2006. And I was traveling to China once or twice a year for research and consulting uh, as part of my university work. And each trip from then on, I began to find a few days to go to Xi'an. I added on usually a few days to interview him. And I knew that somehow his life would be very interesting to Americans. And uh, because partially because he was from the countryside. Also, he was just plain unique in, in the way that he pushed. He was very similar to, in many ways to the people I had met and been collecting stories about. He was innovative. And as I said before, his, his life was actually um, mirrored, mirrored that, followed that of modern China. Uh, his first year of elementary school, of primary school was in was the first year of the People's Republic of China. And so I pursued it, uh, not quite knowing where it was taking me. <laughs> and I have gigabytes of interviews that span 10 years, all of which I've had transcribed because I needed to be able to, to interact with them in various ways and learn from them. But I also needed to learn, I needed to learn history, which I did a lot of on my, on weekends and during vacations when I wasn't in China, I, when I was in the United States, uh, trying to learn as much history as I could uh, from, uh, from other sources than I'm way, because I needed obviously a rounding of, of sources and uh, of what went on in the chaotic 20th century in China and uh, in the early times of the People's Republic of China, uh, that turns out if you dig through the internet, there's a lot there. And I also needed to dig for details. And that was a challenge because Anwei liked to talk about the big picture, about policies, foreign policy, protocol, the structure of the Communist Party, uh, the bureaucracy that in his offices. And, uh, <laughs> And I also want to, I needed to know those, but I also wanted to know what they ate in the village or what they wore 
or did they play any games? Uh, all those details. He wasn't really interested in those when I asked him. He'd give me a little few bits and then he'd go back to the big picture again. So I had to invent some way to try to get at, the, at those details. And I had collected uh, an attempt to really learn a lot of history from different perspectives, a lot of old National Geographics from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And so I took, I photocopied pictures from there and took them with me to the interviews. And I would give them a picture like this, this picture here uh, from the, uh, it's like, I think it's the 1940s, 1942 uh, National Geographic. Uh, because I wondered if that was the kind of clothes he wore. And in this situation, I mean, there are a lot of things I took and he said, no, not really. But this one was actually right on. And he said, yes, that's the kind of clothing almost exactly that we wore for the summer, for the warm months. And then we had another set of clothing for the cold months and winter. And he said, we had two sets of clothes and we wore them for six months without changing. And he said, we just must have smelled awful and were filthy. And he said, I can guarantee you that they were full of lice. But in fact, we had clothes on, we weren't in rags. And so, um, so that sort of got him going. I showed him a lot of pictures of tools, of animals in the villages, um, of, of structures that had been built, of some ceremonies. And that really got him talking about details. I showed him a picture of some plows and he picked out one and said, that's almost like the one we had, but the head is our, the head of ours was, was larger, the part that goes in the ground. And he got up and started stomping around the, the hotel room, showing me how he had learned how to plow when he was a teenager. And he said, it's very hard. And uh, you have to learn how to keep that head, which is a heavy, heavy piece under the ground at just the right level, it, not letting it go too deep or come up out of the ground while an animal is pulling it forward. And so I had a number of demonstrations once I started, started doing this of, of the, the special shoes actually, it turns out they wore uh, that were made of wood with six inch pieces that kept them above some of the mud. So he said he even learned to run in, in the mud. But um, anyway, that really opened up a lot of our conversations about details and, and brought a lot more life into it because I wanted to write a book, not an academic book, but a book that was open to, um, to everybody. And so I have been turned, ter I have been told by people who have, have read it and who are reading it, that it is a real page turner, which is good to hear because I did spend a lot of time trying to learn how <laughs> to, to write this. This, in this style. Um, and it was fun actually to do that. Toward the end of, end of my 10 years of interviewing him, uh, I, I actually mentioned to him that I was going to go to some of the places in Xi'an where I knew that were, I knew were important to his life, one being the university. And he said, oh, don't go by yourself. He said, my wife and I will, will take you. And so we went to the university where they both went. It's a language institute and they both were English majors. And, um, and we had some really good afternoons of going and visiting other places, a museum that he had started, uh, some of the other places that were important in their lives. And then later on, I knew I had to go to Northern China where he had been in a re-education camp during the Cultural Revolution and also had been he was in the re-education camp for about two years, and then he was transferred to work in a foreign affairs office as an interpreter. And, and, but he was there for six or seven years, separated from his family. And I knew that that was a critical part of his life. And so he, he said, again, um, he, he actually knew people there and that we should go together. In fact, he said, the vice president whom he knew um, of the university had been asking him to come give talks and that this would be a good chance for him to do that. And so he communicated with her and she said, yes, if the two of you give a series of maybe six or so lectures on culture and, and, and translating and, 
and various things for our students, then the university can loan you a car and driver so you can drive around to the, to the various places. And so we went and visited the re-education camp. We went to all different places that were important to Mao Zedong and the Communist Party during, that, during the time that they were forming and getting ready to try to challenge the nationalists and take over China. So, um, so it's a big historic center for China. And we also went other places. The picture on the bottom, we went to, we went to former Wang's uh, place and uh, he, where, where he, had, he had been visited by Jimmy Carter and his family uh, for a full day of, of various events. And the village was more than pleased to re, uh, re do, <laughs> re reenact, I guess it was, to, to a slight extent, uh, that visit. And what were, what that meal is, is they, they're the same dishes that they prepared for uh, Carter and his family when they were visiting. And that's uh, Farmer Wong on my, the left and uh, An Wei on my right, who was interpreting. And Jimmy Carter, of course, is a farmer. So, uh, they really enjoyed having him there because he could, he, they said he just, he was just, he was, he was wonderful uh, about listening to them and respecting what they were doing, etc. So I also began to stay with Anway and his wife in their condominium, which gave me a much better feel for just for their life and what it must have been like in the earlier days. It was a little complicated for an interviewer to actually do that. And um, I was very careful to, to sort of, and, and Anwe was too, to sort of keep a certain amount of distance, but, but, we, um, but it was, it was very, very valuable in the long run for me. And so uh, also they came with me, well, Anwe would have come with me anyway to Anshan Village when I was, I was doing school research and that included uh, finally, it, it, actually included Anshan village, the village school. And um, he would have gone as interpreter, but his wife came too. And so uh, she and I had some really good walks around the village and the area of the village. And, and I just learned a lot more about their lives. And uh, so I've, I was very interested in just getting as much sort of detailed, good human interest information as I could. And his wife and I also had a few experiences, <laughs> one of which is in the book. I won't go into it. <laughs> uh, but I still needed to learn to write narrative um, really well. And so I began taking writing courses on the side. Um, I went to the UCLA writing program, which was has online classes. And I took a couple of nonfiction writing courses. And then I took an essay writing course, and then I took some more nonfiction writing courses. And eventually I also took one novel writing course because I needed to learn how to develop a character and bring the character to life. Obviously what I was writing was not a novel. Uh, it was not one of those page turners you were talking about earlier today. Uh, <laughs> not a murder mystery, but in fact, uh, I needed to, to make it very human. And uh, so, those were all very helpful, but even with those, I realized I needed more. And so I applied for a fellowship uh, toward, after I had begun trying to write the book in various, in various ways and doing beginning drafts. And I applied to the uh, Vermont Studio Workshop, which is in very Northern Vermont. And I sat in that office there in the picture in the inside that white building beside the river and for three weeks, but uh, the workshop actually accepted 90% visual artists of all different kinds and only 10% writers. So it was a very rich creative world and community uh, to live in for a few weeks. And I had the opportunity of just having long conversations with, uh, with all different kinds of artists and writers uh, about how you create a project and how you, how you bring it to fullness, but also how you end it. 
it's not so easy to decide how to end something, be it a painting or, or a book. That is, where do you stop? Where is going too far, uh, too much? And so that was very helpful. And by the end of those three weeks, I had created the arc of the story, which is like the spine of the story. And without it, it's very hard to, to create a book. And so I, once I did that, then it was just sort of write, 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 redraft, redraft. And of course, that's the writing process. Uh, but there are also other things for writers to do, like you need to find an agent unless you're going to self-publish. And then you help the, the, the agent actually finds the publisher, but um, that's not easy. And you do a lot of things for the agent ahead of time. Uh, to help that process. One is, for instance, to write a proposal, which is about 50 pages long and includes a marketing plan and it includes drafts of chapters and much more. So it's a, it's a whole nother project in itself that you learn you have to do even if you don't want to. Uh, so I was learning about a world completely new to me. I was also still a faculty member at Mount St. Mary's and had a, had a job. So I was doing all of this on the side, which of course many, many people do. There are very few people who live as writers. And it took a lot of time. And I sought advice from many, many people uh, over and over. So when you, when you see the acknowledgement page in a book, believe me, those acknowledgements are very severe. Probably every person they've they mentioned have spent hundreds of hours helping them with a the book. And so in the long run, it really is written by a community of people. And now I am going to, whoops, excuse me, come here. <laughs> I am having a lot of trouble. I, I'm just going to have to go quickly through the slides. I'm going to talk very briefly about An Wei. Um, so you have some idea of who this person is. I've told you a little bit about him, but uh, he is in his late 70s now. Uh, he's not in great health. Uh, he went through a terrible, I mean, he's almost, they almost starved to death when he was in high school for three years. Um, and life has been pretty hard. And when he was in the re-education camp, the food was terrible. So, uh, I think life in rural China and a lot of China during this, this for the current older generation has been really hard. Um, he lives in the center of China still with his wife and he works daily, even though he's not in great health on a pro major project uh, that's now in collaboration with a large university. But he has spent most days of his life trying to make the world a better place for various people. And that includes, um, uh, okay, good, I succeeded. <laughs> I keep trying three different ways to change the, the slides. Um, so his life, his life is just, a, a, he's spent a lot of time trying to trying to make the world a better place. The quickest history you'll ever hear of China is on this, on this page. Uh, it started, as I've said, in 1949, the People's Republic of China. The pictures are from the September 1949 uh, National Geographic of the communist troops going into Beijing as victors. And um, they went in in September and in October, they declared the beginning of the People's Republic of China. And for An Wei's life, there were some immediate uh, improvements. And one was education. So by the next fall, by the first fall, the, the Communist Party had been in power. They started rural education universally. And it was the first time there had ever been a school in Anshan village. It was in a one-room school, and it was in a one-room Buddhist temple, actually, and uh, with four grades in that class with one teacher. And it was the beginning. And for An Wei, uh, it was magnificent. Uh, they also, the, the new government, 
did away with foot binding, which meant that the, the binding clause on his sisters, and it was his oldest sister, uh, on her feet were removed. And as adult, she has smaller feet than would be normal, but she walks pretty well. So she was saved from having these terrible feet, even that were even in the villages of being three or four inches long. Uh, a very painful, awful process. Rural farming also was changed to cooperatives and the villagers, uh, according to Anway's family, really enjoyed the beginning cooperatives. It helped them learn to share things with their, with their neighbors uh, in organized ways. And so they shared their, their tools and their, their work, you know, their laboring abilities and their animals with each other in rather coordinated ways. But then uh, things moved toward bigger and bigger cooperatives and then eventually rather quickly to communes. And those became very cumbersome for the and unpleasant for the for a lot of the villagers, at least in the Anjong area. Um, and because there were people who were really quite incompetent or or after something or trying to, you know, trying to get back at someone for something who who controlled a lot of the, the things, like the animals and who could use them and who got the good animals and who didn't. Anway, actually, there's one incident that I, is included in the book with Anway outwitting the men who actually controlled the, the animals in the commune sh animal shed. And Anway figured out how to outsmart him. Uh, so that was, um, that was pretty, pretty useful. Anway's childhood, um, as I said, he loved school. He was the one child in the family who was allowed to go to school. His grandfather hated education and thought it was useful. So Anwe began in 1950. He worked harder than any other kid. He, he wrote all the characters, he write the characters on his hand or in the dirt or wherever he could trying to learn them. He learned all the math formulas, etc. He was the best, one of the best students ever. He went on to the next layer of schooling, which was fifth or sixth grade in a, in a little town nearby. And then he tested, he got, he passed all the tests to go to a middle school in the county and then, uh, then the high school. And he went well beyond anyone else in the village who'd never gotten past about the fourth or fifth grade. And that was very few. Most of them just dropped out of school after a year or so. Uh, he, he was stubborn and hardworking. And I am going to very quickly read you just a little tiny bit of description of him from the beginning of the book. A shock of black hair framed his square face and his eyes danced with mischief. He loved to explore and play hard. But by age four, he began taking on farm chores. Though he worked willingly, he showed the fierce temper and stubborn nature that would accompany him throughout his life. As a toddler, he cried and rolled his way through temper tantrums, obeying no one. He stopped only when he exhausted himself. And that sort of describes his life. <laughs> he was very stubborn and extremely hardworking. And he, worked for, he was a workaholic, basically. That picture is of him at, at the end of sixth grade. And he actually never looks like that that I know of. And I've seen him in some down times too, but he certainly looks sad and uh, worried at that point. The other picture is one on Wei found on, on the uh, Chinese internet, which is, is actually of his school uh, and their dining area with the headmaster talking to the students. It's not on, on Wei's class though. Um, as a young adult, he passed the grueling college entrance exam. He majored in English and became a school leader. He was, he was very important as a leader in the university or, or the institute. And that went on, he got a lot of honors, but at the end of his education in college, the last week actually of his, of his last year, the Cultural Revolution began and everything went down the tubes. Um, 
he, the first two years were very dangerous for him because he was a school leader and a good student, so they were after him. Uh, he did manage to, to compromise enough to not be killed or end up in jail or tortured. And um, then he was actually hired by the Foreign Affairs Office in Xi'an to, to be an interpreter. Uh, but there were no people coming, so that wasn't very productive, but it did get him out from underneath the college uh, Red Guards. He married uh, Niu Jianhua, and that picture is, the picture on the left is their wedding day. And, but then, uh, not too long after that, they broke up the office he was working in because there was no work because no one was coming to visit China during the Cultural Revolution. And so he was sent to a re-education school in the North to learn from the farmers. And that's where he was. And the picture on the bottom is of, of that school at about the time he was there. He would have been the one carrying the flag because he was younger than the others who were there. But he said the jobs were horrendous and he evidently suffered a lot, although he never talked about it, his wife did. Uh, he managed to keep his English alive, though, secretly. Uh, this is the picture on the left is the, uh, are the hills behind the education camp. And he actually, and they go on from there. It's not just that hill, but they, they go back and it's, it's undeveloped there. And so he would climb up there with an English volume of Mao's work, which he managed to keep by outwitting the head of the re-education school. And so he, after that incident with the commander there, he kept, he was very secretive about what he did, but he would go up in the hills and read English and then also practice it alive. Later on, when he was back in Xi'an, he actually came across a discarded copy in a hotel room of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And so he used it to translate it, to improve his English for translating and interpreting. And he did that by getting up nights at three o'clock. He'd go to bed, trying to go to bed sort of early. He'd get up after a few hours sleep and translate from three o'clock on uh, until he had to go to work. And so those were a couple of ways that he managed to keep his English. He eventually became an English interpreter for foreign visitors and he was very good. And so he ended up uh, with actually uh, interpreting for people like Henry Kissinger, who's up there. He said that was hard because Kissinger has a German accent and Jimmy Carter and many other people when he was very young. His first uh, head of state was the prime minister of England and Anway was 32. He began traveling to various countries uh, as the interpreter for Chinese officials. And he also became a visiting scholar in the US for a year, working with someone who was actually quite honored by the Chinese, but whose reputation had been lost. But all during this time, colleagues were, colleagues were very jealous. And because he refused to bribe, he had really good jobs, they thought, but, and he also refused to bribe anyway or to, to um, and he challenged corrupt officials and sort of, uh, he also challenged ridiculous bureaucracy. Um, so he offended a lot of people and they, he said, you had to watch yourself all the time because people went after you in any way they could. And he also on the side began to, to start plenty of projects. He created a translators association. He brought the global volunteers there and uh, the most audacious thing he did, which annoyed the local officials a lot, was he began a democratic congress in his village for that lasted for seven years. So that's Anway. And I will stop sharing if I can get my, yes, okay. My cursor has been going on and off. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was amazing, Nancy. Thank you so much. Um, lots of, of fantastic information in there and what a great story. I'm gonna uh, bring myself up here for just a, a minute. Right. Uh, 
let's see. Whoops, there we go. Okay, so I'm going. I'm going to join you here for a few moments. Good. Okay, so, great. Um, and now I'm going to um, let's see. Get the uh, there we go. Um, so the participants are now able to unmute themselves. So if you all want to unmute yourself for a moment, you can give a, a hand for the presentation. <laughs> You couldn't see us, but we were here. <laughs> um, so it was, uh, again, really wonderful. Uh, and we'll, uh, um, I, I think that you covered lots of fabulous ground very well. Uh, and I'd like to just open it up to see if anybody in the crowd has any specific questions or if any of you, you know, visited China or some of you might have lived in China. That's right. Um, yes, yes. And yes. Uh, if uh, what uh, what some of your associations with. So either uh, put it in the chat or um, we'll be uh, I'm going right. to gonna unspotlight myself here because um, you don't need me. Uh, <laughs> we'll just look at the gallery view. If anybody has a question or comment, just up there, Sally, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, great. Hang on. I'm going to go to gallery. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. Okay. So Sally, Sally DeVore has a question. Okay. Hey, I'm just so excited because my brother-in-law is very involved with China and I would love for him to see this presentation. Um, I texted him quickly, but he, he was going out to dinner. He lives in DC, but also I want to welcome Euralia because she okay. came to her first Zoom meeting and she is a dear friend of my uh, brother-in-law and, and my sister. And so yeah. um, I, I hope she enjoyed it and that she will come back for more. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> I, I loved yeah. it. It was so interesting and it was, you were great to pick that, you know, the story of the person in the rural area uh -huh. because there are many more stories out there of people living in the big cities. Yes, yes. So that was a wonderful pick. Congratulations yes. that you. Well, thank you. And of course, I was very, I was very lucky <laughs> to have met him because if I hadn't, we hadn't just come across each other for a whole nother reason, uh, I would never have known about him, but he just is, yeah. Yeah, thank and you it, very it, much, I, yeah. It took Go him ahead. a little while to to open up, a couple of years, right? <laughs> oh yeah, but I, I didn't even know his history. I mean, we were so focused on trying to figure out how to get American and Chinese citizens uh, connected uh, that in fact, I didn't really know much about him uh, personally for a couple of years and it took my the first day in the village when he was there for me to begin to get some sense of who he was beyond you know doing all these things related to trying to connect the United States and China and so so it was that experience that probably opened up the whole possibility and the fact that it was such a rich background uh, that Americans have no idea of. And we get so many stories about just one one perspective. And it's just, it, yeah, so it just opened itself up. So thank you very much. And Eulalia, you've worked with orphans in China, is that correct? Uh, not, no, not orphans. No, oh. Eulalia, the lady who was just speaking. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. But I did have one question about your work because you know that period of time unfortunately they put in so much work for their country and then of course we all know about this one child policy right imagine Anwei also had to go through now so how is he being taken care of now now that he's oh oh yeah you do uh, yeah he has um and i don't know I've sort of stayed away from his personal life to some extent because I at one point asked him, he has a granddaughter, and at one point um, I asked him if he, when I was thinking about who to dedicate the book to, I asked him if it would be appropriate uh, 
or a good idea to dedicate it to her. And he said, no, please don't, just don't involve her. Uh, and I realized I just needed to, to sort of stay back from that. But having said that, he has, I have met some of his, what are they? They're, they're nieces and nephews who live near him, who are very, um, who are very concerned. And he's actually also being taken care of, I think rather carefully uh, by uh, some of the young professors whom he has helped uh, grow their expertise in various things related to um, a particular woman whose name is Helen Foster Snow, whom he's spent a lot of time with. So he's always given to other people and helped them better themselves. And some of those people are, feel very dedicated to him. And I know that there are two uh, young women professors who check in on him now every single day uh, to make sure he's doing okay and his, and his wife. So I think um, I, his, his, his kids um, are in different parts, you know, they're in different parts of the world, so to speak. And so um, that's just a, but the rest, the rest of the family is sort of, and friends are, are coalescing around him because it turns out, uh, and in fact, I've only learned in the later years how much he's really done for other people because he never talks about it. Uh, it's just been something he's been doing. And so I think they feel a real dedication to him in keep making sure he's, he's okay. Can I ask a culinary question? Not really related that much but since you've been to china so much can you compare uh real chinese food in china versus americanized versions and do you have a favorite dish like cashew chicken or something oh <laughs> you know I, the the dishes are really different and i have only my whole my experience in china are 95 percent in the area that sort of goes from Beijing to Shanghai and out to Xi'an and, and somewhat farther west, but never to the southwest where the food is the Sichuan type food or to the south. I've only been in the Guangzhou area a couple of times. And uh, so, but I don't know the names of the dishes <laughs> in China. Um, in a lot of places here in the United States, you don't find it, but certainly in Mon Monterey Park, uh, when I've gone with Chinese friends, I've certainly uh, found good Chinese cooking from my, my perspective, but I'm a real wimp. I mean, I don't like hot, spicy food, so uh, <laughs> Me too. I, have a, I do have the one thing that was very interesting was I, I spent time in Xi'an in a, a I was going to give a lecture to the faculty of a university and he took me to a Muslim uh, place for lunch for wide, special wide noodles that are about two and a half inches or three inches wide and long. And by the time I had finished eating that, it was actually delicious and it was, it was lamb and <laughs> I was covered. <laughs> I had on a silk suit and luckily I had a large scarf because I had to cover my whole scarf, <laughs> the whole front of my jacket with the scarf because it was covered with splatters from this delicious meal. So I've had many, many, many wonderful meals, but I unfortunately I don't know the names of them. So I have a question for you, Nancy, about the final publication of the book. How did you feel about this as opposed to your other, you know, your other recent or your academic books? Was there a different sense of accomplishment, a different sense of ownership, a, a different fear of it going out to the public, or was it just it was, another book? No, it was, they were, I mean, it's so different from anything else I'd done. Um, it's just, it was a, well, <laughs> in this day and age, it was a pleasure to have it published, <laughs> number <I> one. <laughs> <laughs> and the editor who bought it from, from Roman and, and Littlefield, which is a pretty good sized publishing house, wrote and said, 
when she had she had read the, a draft and she said, this is a fantastic story and beautifully written. And I thought, you never hear that from editors. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was blown, I must say, that was an enormous, that was hard to believe actually. And so that was fantastic. And she has been enormously supportive all the way through. Um, so uh, so it, was, it was a good feeling. I've never worried about it going out there, although I have no idea what's going to happen in China. I mean, that's a whole nother, a whole nother piece now. I have the papers for, uh, for it being translated, but I don't think that will happen now. They, that was, those agreements were all done a few years ago. So. Interesting. But China changes, you know, you never know what's next, or I don't anyway, being a, being a foreigner. Uh, do you, I, I won't say, do you have, when are your plans to go back? Because everybody's travel plans are a bit of a mess right now. That's right. You know, I think I've probably made my last trip for, for a variety of reasons. And I decided that partially because there are other parts of the world <laughs> that I would like to see. And I've been going to China for a long time. Uh -huh. and, uh, sort of, sort of um, and obviously there's a lot more to see in China, but, um, but there's also a lot. And I have family, one of my, my sons is in, uh, in Europe, live, lives in Europe with his family. So that's probably first maybe, you know, whenever we do travel again. But the other thing is that when I go to, part of it is I have turned over all the research projects to the university. And so that's been very satisfying because in fact, they became part of the university structure, which it was very nice to see. But in fact, going back, so I have no specific reasons to go back. And when I go to Xi'an and I've been staying with, Anwei and his wife, um, it's a big deal even when I don't stay with them. And there's sometimes, for instance, when his wife had had a back operation, I said, no. <laughs> and uh, so I stayed in the hotel, but it's a big deal. I mean, Anwei is an organizer. When I arrive, he has always handed me a printed schedule of our schedule when I was free to do things, when I was going to give a talk at some university that I didn't know I was going to give, when I, we were going to inter our interview time, et cetera. And so I didn't want to, I don't want to sort of put that, that stress <laughs> into, the, into the family situation. And, uh, and now of course, who knows what's going to go on in China. It would be it would be nice to go back, but I'm just. Uh, has um, has this whetted your appetite to write more non-academic books? Oh yeah, uh, I. <laughs> well, I don't know whether it's even writing. It's it's a little hard to say. Um, my webmaster has convinced me that I should actually put the China images into a book. And so that's a that's a good possibility because I have just reread all of them and they have amazing staying power, which surprises me. Uh, but a lot of them are relevant today. And uh, but I'm also doing a project with two two good friends who we come from very different cultures. And yes, one of them's raising her hand. <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> We come from really different cultural backgrounds and we've been friends for a long time and we started out just exploring, you know, why we're, why we're, we're friends and have so many interests and um, it's just become a really fascinating dig into all of our, to the, our backgrounds. So who knows what that will become, whether it will become a book or, or something else, uh, we don't know. Yeah, so. totally. Andy, we 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 used to meet for lunch. Now we still meet for Zoom lunch, and right. so we meet about every three weeks. And it was my daughter's idea to say, "Why don't you you uh, tell about your backgrounds?" So that's what we've been doing. So we talk, and Nancy writes it down, and then keeps track of it. So we started when we were children, mm -hmm. and now we just got through 
we take turns and now I'm up to uh, finish college. Talk about my college days. <laughs> so next week, it'll be, this week is going to be our other friend's college days. And the next time it'll be Nancy's college days. <laughs> so that's what we're doing. So she right, that sounds involved. like a book. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. she doesn't know it's going to be a book or not. Anyway, she writes it all down. Yeah. yeah. Or records it. Yeah, that's right. I'm, yeah, I'm collecting another lot of gigabytes of data and who yeah. knows what we're going to do with it. But yeah. it's, it's been really amazing. I mean, yeah. it, it, for the three of us. The other one is, is Japanese American. So we just have enormously different. Right. Experience. A white person, a black, a, a African American and a Japanese American. Right. Different backgrounds. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and her really webmaster fun. says he should have more images, right? Pardon? Didn't your webmaster say we should keep all our images? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He thinks it, <laughs> he actually thinks it will make a great documentary. And I said, you know, are you going to do that? Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, but you know, just keep all the information, don't knows? throw anything yeah. away, and uh, yeah. someone will yeah. turn something Yeah, to that's it. a bad thing to say when oh, you're Lord, to downsize, right? So we'll end up on National Geographic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I want to be at the launch party. Right. <laughs> all right. So I think that uh, unless there's other comments, we'll uh, we're at three fifteen. So I think we'll wind up. So again, another. Oh, great. Well, thank well, you. Thanks for the fantastic you. presentation. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, good luck, Nancy. And again, the title is One in a Billion. Mm -hmm. right. um, you can just Google this, or is it Nancy Pine? NancyPine.info. And it's for sale. It's also supposed to be for sale at Broman, so that they keep running out. They got oh, eight copies good. and someone went in and bought seven of them. So, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, but, I, I got right. mine from Barnes and Noble. That was nice right. and easy. Yes, that's so, right. uh, Anyway, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Nancy, for uh, sharing your great stories with us. And uh, thank you, Sarah, for your daughter sending Nancy my way so I could have a chance to meet such a wonderful person. Well, yeah, my daughter, she's part of the, the community that got acknowledged. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> she's awesome. <laughs> right. right. So thank you all, and um, see you all next time. Thank all you right. all. Thank you all Bye. very much. Right. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Now Enjoy. we have something to talk about Saturday. Right. <laughs> <laughs>